the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. And by way of introduction, last week we uh, talked about the New Jerusalem. It's a 1,500 square mile cube that's going to come down from heaven. If you, uh, if you just typed in New Jerusalem, if you Googled that and pulled up images, you, they, you'd see a pretty good rendering of it. So it's a gold cube that's going to rest upon the earth, and it's so big that it's going to rise 900 miles uh, above the earth's atmosphere. This new Jerusalem, that's the place that Jesus is, is building for us right now, the church right now. He's putting the finishing touches on this. We talked about how when he renews the earth and when he renews the heavens in chapter 21, verse 1, there are not going to be any oceans or seas. And, and uh, by the way, I didn't touch on this last week, but a renewed heaven means all three heavens are going to be refreshed. The sky, you know, we've destroyed the ozone layer. and you know, but So the sky, that's the first heaven. The second heaven we would call outer space. All of that's going to be refreshed and renewed as well. You think of all of the planets and stars and constellations and galaxies and everything in the universe, you know. And then the third heaven, that's the realm of God. It's all going to get a remodeling job. And he's doing all of this um, w- with us in mind. It's, it's just amazing. So there's no, um, there's no ocean or there, there's no seas a- according to chapter 21. So as we begin chapter 22, how are we and the planet hydrated? Because we're still going to be thirsty in our new bodies. We're still going to drink water. It's interesting, isn't it? And what, what or where does our water supply come from? Well, Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now let me just put this in uh, you know, the, the original language. It's amazing what's going on here. First of all, it says it's a pure river of the water of life. The word river there is, the Greek word is potamus. Hippopotamus. You, you get, hippo is a uh, river, it was a water horse. That's what hippopotamus means. But potamus means a flood. Uh, a flood. Uh, so there's this flood of water, uh, and it, it says in verse 1 also that it's clear as crystal. The word clear there in Greek is the word lampros. We get our word lamp from this. So there's this radiant water that's flowing from the throne of God Almighty and the throne of the Lamb. It's coming right out of the throne, this, this, uh, this gush, uh, this if you will, it's originating directly from from God, and, and this supernatural supernatural water is going to cascade down Main Street, whatever the Lord does, calls that, supplying the whole planet with this magical water. That's pretty wild, isn't it? Verse two, in the middle of its street. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each yielding, notice I didn't say the word tree, that's in italics, it's not in the original language, each yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So we find that, that, that the tree of life is going to be in this new earth, a scenario, and you say, well, is this the same tree of life as the Garden of Eden? Yes, it is. Why don't you turn with me to uh, Genesis chapter 3. I want to show you something. We've already ta- taken our verse-by-verse study through Genesis, uh, but some of you have joined us after that. Um, Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 through 24 this is after they got caught. They've, you know, they, they've eaten the forbidden fruit. God's already given the judgment or the, uh, to the serpent and then to the man and the woman. Verse 22, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. 
Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. That's interesting. That's always interesting to me. Adam was not made from the soil of Eden. He wasn't. That's, it was a supernatural garden, right? But, but so, so, so God put Adam and Eve out of the garden in this land where, from the ground from which they were taken. I think it was Jerusalem. It always seems to go back to that place. And so he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, just reading that in our English translation, we, we don't get all of the fabulous stuff that's there. Here's the way that translates in the original Hebrew. The cherubim, uh, one cherub is, you know, cherubim is plural, you know, so more than one. There, there were cherubim at the east of the garden with a flaming sword. The word flaming there means to destroy, just to wipe out. So when people look for the Garden of Eden, they're always looking for the, like the Fertile Crescent in Mesopotamia, some really lush place. They really need to be looking for the most parched piece of land over there. I think the Arabian Desert, all of that perhaps was the Garden of Eden. But it, so a flaming sword just wiped out everything. It turned every way to guard, and that word guard in Hebrew means to hide the, the, the way or the path to the tree of life. So... Let me put that all together now. God takes Adam and Eve, puts them out of the garden, puts them right into place from the dirt from which he made them from, Adam from. And then he wipes out the place where the Garden of Eden is. He takes this supernatural tree back up to heaven and he hides the path to it so the enemy doesn't have access to it. Because halfway through Revelation, we see that the enemy still has access to the heavenly realm, right? And this is a supernatural tree. And God said, listen, I, I, I don't want this man and this woman, Adam and Eve, to eat from this tree of life. Why? Because if they ate from it in their broken condition, their broken sinful condition, they would live forever broken. Right? And that's not what God wanted. And see, we talked about this uh, you know, a, a week or so ago, that, that innocence was never God's end game. That's what, any, everything began with innocence, but innocence isn't perfection. Redemption is perfection. So now that he's got everybody redeemed, everyone is immortal bodies like Christ, the, the church and all, and of course there's some other people that are alive that uh, you know, I, I don't know what to say about them. There's a lot of mystery in all of this. But there's th th this tree of life, Life is going to be taken from heaven, put right down in the middle of Main Street on the new earth. And the river of the water of life is going to go on both sides of it. And the fruit of this tree, what an amazing tree. It bears 12 different kinds of fruit, one per month. And there's some um, theologians that suggest that it tastes like whatever you desire it to taste like. So you could just take a, you know, in February, you could take a piece of fruit off of the tree of life, and man, I'm really in the mood for some Godiva chocolate, and bam, <laughs> there it is, right? You know? I mean, just that, it's, just a, it's just a fabulous thing to, to consider. It's interesting to me that this tree bears 12 different types of fruit according to the months and all. So does that suggest that the earth is still rotating around the sun? If there's some passage of time or something like that that's still going on. We know that we don't need the sun to shine on the earth, that it's going to be illuminated by the glory of God at this time. But there still looks like there's months in all of this. And another mystery to me is that the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, the healing of the nations. The word healing there, the Greek word is therapia. We get therapy from this word, right? And it means a medical cure. So the, the nations, that, that, that's ethnos, we get ethnic from that. That's, it speaks of all the Gentile races. When they bring their glory, we saw that at the end of the last chapter, that they and their kings are going to bring their glory, their homage, and their honor, that is their, their, their uh, teammate, their, their valuables, their precious, their money. They're going to bring this to the New Jerusalem, to the King of Kings as kind of a tribute. And they're going to be offered according to 20, chapter 22, verse 2, um, some of these leaves to take back to their homeland. And there's supernatural healing properties, a, a magical cure-all. 
in these leaves. That's amazing, isn't it? Now, that, that makes you ask a question. Wait a minute, is people still going to get sick? I thought, I thought everything's perfect now. I thought everything bad is taken care of. I don't really have an answer to you for that. Uh, I, I don't know what the need is for here. And there's some theologians that say, well, this is just speaking about how, you know, they kind of explain it all the way. I'm afraid to do such. And I, I, I'm afraid to, to explain it away because the last couple of verses of this chapter, and I've studied those too, so I don't want to fool with that. Uh, verse 3, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants, doulos servants, that means slaves by choice, his, his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Now, I know that there's some people that are opposed to tattoos, but this is a tattoo that you're going to like. The name of Jesus on our foreheads. And you say, what, what does that mean? The word name here in Greek is the word onoma. Do you say that with me? Onoma. Very good. It means authority and character. All of the authority and the character of Jesus on our foreheads. That's like a backstage pass to everything and everywhere, right? We're going to be treated differently because his name is on our foreheads. That's just amazing to me. And you know, Jesus said to the disciples, you know, it's, it's great that you guys believe in me, but one day people are going to believe in me that haven't even seen me face to face. That's you and me, right? And he says there's a special blessing for those folks that believe having not seen. Isn't that amazing? One day, very soon, I believe, you and I we're going to see him face to face. Face to face. And then we're going to reign with him forever. Look, look at verse uh, 5. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign. That means to rule forever and ever. And then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. I mean, you can rely on them. You can believe them. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Now, the first time I read over that verse, I just kind of skimmed past something. I don't know how many times I've taught the book of Revelation, but I've never really seen this word until uh, this week of study. Verse 6, there's a, there's a word that I want you to circle. Um, the things which must, circle the word must, must shortly take place. Why would I have you circle the word must? Because all of this is inevitable. This is what God, God has to do all of, allow all, everything to, you reach a climax and then he comes in and saves the day. All of the evil that you see happening in the world today, even these notorious, vile things that we see ISIS doing. I mean, my goodness, some of those videos, if they, you know, and of course they want to terrify people with those videos. But you can watch videos of Christians being executed for not renouncing Jesus. Now, I don't know if you have an interest in seeing such a thing. It will shake you to the core to see that kind of evil. That it, it's, it's, so, it, it, it's so outspoken in your face, right? It's not happening in America really yet, but it's coming, I believe, right? The Lord says, hey, all of these things must take place. It's got to get worse before he comes back and, and refreshes everything, right? It's inevitable. Uh, verse 7, Behold, I am coming quickly. And blessed is he who believes the words of the prophecy of this book. Is that what your Bible says? That's right. It's a different word, isn't it? Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Not just believes, not just reads. Verse 7, blessed is he who keeps 
That word tereo, it means to guard, uh, to, to keep your eye on something because you assume someone is going to try and sneak and take it from you, right? If I gave you something of great value and I said, now uh, you need to keep this, what I'm actually saying to you is someone's going to try and steal that and you better, don't take your eyes off of it. And, and, and what Jesus says here, he says with, with an exclamation point, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and blessed is he who keeps his eye, guards the words of the prophecy of this book. Verse 8, Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before, before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Well, then he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant. I am a, a, a son doulos, a co-slave with you, right? A and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. In other words, he says, I, I, I quit falling down and trying to worship me. Worship God. Only worship God, says this angel. And he said to me, verse 10, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. In other words, whatever you are, you're just going to be. Sometimes we're trying to change people that have not been reborn. Now, they say they've been reborn, um, but there's no fruit in their life that bears that they have a change of nature. First John says that if anyone is in Christ, the old has passed away, all things have become new. That means you become a brand new person once you become a follower of Jesus Christ, Right? And because you're a brand new person in Jesus Christ, you have new attitudes, new interests, new appetites, new attractions. Every, you're, you're a different person than you were before, say. Sometimes I think we're, we, we keep trying to draw people in that are not really in. They're just not really in. Reminds me of J. Vernon McGee's story of the prodigal pig. I've shared this before, right? The prodigal son, you know, he goes off and he's wallowing with the pigs and the slop and all this. When he finally comes to himself and says, man, even my dad's servants are living better than I'm living. I'm going to go home and beg forgiveness from my dad and, and see if he'll take me back. And so as the prodigal son was leaving the, you know, the, the pigsty and all this, he took one of the pigs with him. He took the pig home with him to his dad and they gave it a bath and put a nice bow in its hair and cleaned it all up and everything, right? But just as soon as he let that pig alone, that pig ran right back to the slop. Why? Because it was a pig. And you've got to have a new nature, right? See, you don't need to grit your teeth and try and act like a better person than you are. If you're really his, he'll give you new interests, new desires. You'll have an interest and a hunger for his word and to be around his people and to worship him in spirit and truth. All these things that Christians do, see. Sometimes I think we're, we keep trying to, you know, the whole prodigal pig kind of a thing here. So he says, listen, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. Just let him, you don't have to force this. I tell you that the greatest grace that God has given me as a pastor is to help me realize that the Holy Spirit is the one that handles discipleship. I used to think it was our job, the church, to go and round up prodigal pigs and try and figure out a way to get them to come here and sit and listen to the Word and read their Bible and pray and tithe and all the stuff that when the Lord finally relieved me of that and said, that's not your job. The Holy Spirit knows those who have been reborn because He stamps them with, they're stamped with the Holy Spirit, right? And so the Holy Spirit draws people. If someone's really saved, they, they can only run so long before the hounds of heaven come after them, right? So he says, it's inevitable who is unjust or filthy or righteous and all of this. Another interesting thing that he says here in verse 10, he says, for the time is at hand. You go, wait a minute here, Pastor Philip. This, is, this, this was written 2,000 years ago. 
I mean, you're telling me that we've been in the last days for 2,000 years? Yes. Because a day to the Lord is like a thousand years to you and I. It's just been two days since Jesus went to, uh, you know, to, to make our dwelling place, according to John chapter 14, right? So we've been in the last days for 2,000 years now. Look at, uh, look at verse 12. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my... What does your Bible say next? Reward is with me. That's the word misthros, uh, uh, misthos in, in Greek. The reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, says the Lord Jesus. Notice he says he's coming with his reward. Now, are we rewarded according to our beliefs or according to our works? Our works. Our works. Salvation is a free gift. Heavenly rewards are not free. They're not. And you need to hear this because I don't want you to be empty-handed when you stand before him one day. The rewards that he hands out, this word rewards, misthos, it means pay for service or wages. The rewards that you and I receive in heaven, it's based on our works. Now, we're not saved by works. We don't work our way to heaven. We don't work to make the Lord love us anymore. He loves us unconditionally. And the moment we acknowledge our sin, put our faith and trust in Him, we are accepted in the beloved. Heaven is secure. It's a sweet relationship that we have with the Lord, right? But listen, there are crowns that he gives out for people that anxiously await his return. There are crowns that he's going to give out for people that have endured persecution. There are crowns that he's going to give to pastors who have faithfully taught the whole counsel of the Word of God. And when I discovered that years ago, I thought, oh my goodness, I've got to quit all this topical teaching and start teaching through the whole book here. I don't want to miss out on this reward, right? And there are rewards for sharing your faith. There are rewards for anxiously looking for His return. Rewards for our works. It's not something we hear often enough in churches today. Verse 14, Blessed are those who um, believe His commandments. Is that what your Bible says? Do. 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 And this word poeo in the Greek, it means to exercise without delay. Exercise without delay. Everyone say that with me. Exercise without delay. We've talked about this many times. Delayed obedience is disobedience, isn't it? The Lord tells you to do something, do it quickly. If the Lord tells us things that we're supposed to be doing, do them readily, quickly. We're, to, we're supposed to be doers of the Word, not hearers only. I love that he says, blessed are those who do His commandments. I love that he uses that word because the word commandments in Greek, in tole, well, it means an injunction and it means precepts, but I love the third word in the Strong's concordance on this. It, it also means prescriptions. Take your prescriptions. And what happens if you don't take your pills for your heart or your blood pressure or whatever, right? He's saying, listen, my commandments are prescriptions for your health. See, we look at these commandments of God and we say, well, that sounds like something somebody ought to try. But not me. I, you know, I, but I'm, I'm, highlighting, I'm highlighting my Bible. Look, look at all that I'm highlighting. It's like, surely that counts for something, right? I've got some Greek words written in there and, and uh, diff different colored highlighters. Maybe God's going to look at that one day and go, oh, Philip, that's impressive. He, he doesn't care what we highlight. He doesn't care the notes that we write in the margins. Not nearly as much as what we are living out. Do His commandments. Take His prescriptions. They're for your health. They're for your blessing and they're for your benefit. Now, verse 15 
Well, let, let me finish verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. And we already spoke about the gates are individual pearls, right? I don't know if they're hung on you know, hinges, or I, I, I've got, surely there's got to be some high-tech way that these huge pearls are mounted on these gates. But he says, whoever does his commandments, takes his prescriptions, you know, will have the right to the tree of life, and he'll enter through the gates into the city. Boy, that's what we want, right? But outside, and the word outside, the context means outside the gates, right? Because we just talked about the gates. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Now, who are these people? I thought all the bad guys were in the lake of fire by now, right? Anybody have an explanation for this? I don't. I don't know who this is. I know that the gates are never closed. There's no need to close the gates. Of course, he has an angel at every gate, right? And I can take you to second, first or second Kings and show you one angel wiped out about 65,000 people in a battle. I mean, that one angel is all you need at the gate, right? But he's going to have an angel at each of these gates. But then we see outside the gates are these dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral. That actually means prostitutes and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, you know, and the word for dogs there is a, the Greek word. Uh, a lot of people think that it's not talking about you know, like pet dogs like that. That this is a word that they use to describe a male prosti temple prostitute. But that doesn't make it doesn't make any more sense if if you it's, this is bizarre, isn't it? Who who are these people outside the gates? That's that's wild. I, I don't know. Verse sixteen. I Jesus have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So he uses all of these messianic titles now to confirm this is who I am. And the spirit and the bride say, everyone shout that word, come. And let him who hears say, come. come. There you go. And let him who thirst. Come. <laughs> That was a, the third one was a little weak there. I, I said the third one, and I put up two fingers. The third one, A, 2, and D, right? Uh, come, 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 and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take uh, the water of life freely. Verse 17, the idea here is that a mature Christian is somebody that wants Jesus to come back for us. Now, we've all had seasons in life where we, you know, where we, it's like I remember when I was a newlywed with Tam. There was this book, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Happen in 1988. And we were on our honeymoon at the Feast of Trumpets when Rosh Hashanah, when this guy, you know, he did all this math. And, and I was thinking, Lord, I, I, I want you to come back, but could you hold off for about like a week? <laughs> And, you know, sometimes young couples, it's like, well, I want to have children, or we want to see the baby. Or, I listen, I understand that those kinds of things that make us kind of draw back from this. But in a basic sense, isn't it true that a growing, healthy, mature Christian has a longing for the Lord to come and fix this mess? Right? Because we love what He loves and we hate what He hates, and we see these terrible things that are happening around us. I mean, I heard of a middle school today where a girl was raped here in Pensacola. That, that angers and grieves me, doesn't it you? I want King Jesus to come back and clean up this mess, right? And there's some Christians, boy, you talk about the Lord coming back, they don't like to hear that. I don't want to focus on all that. You know what that reveals? Stagnation. If that's you, you need to take that to heart. We're supposed to be looking for, anxiously looking for the Lord to return because only He can fix everything. Only He can make it all right. Verse 18, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away 
from the words of the book of this prophecy. God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Could that be the people outside the gate? Maybe, I, I don't know. But here's what's interesting to me. The word adds there. Epitathemi is the Greek word. It means to add to in a friendly or a hostile way. See, there's some people that add to God's word in a hostile way. They want to try and make, make it not make sense and to find fault with it or something. But there's also adding to God's word in a friendly way. I, when I hear prosperity teachers taking God's word out of context to try and promote that everyone is supposed to be healthy, wealthy, blessed, never sick, that's, that's adding something of their own emphasis to make it mean something that it, didn't, that it doesn't mean in its context. Add to the play. I'll give them plagues, says the Lord in verse 18. Well, that word means wounds and calamity. And if you take away from the word, well, that means to remove literally or figuratively. And I'll tell you what, when I became a Calvary Chapel pastor, years ago, you know, I came out of the Southern Baptist tradition. My father's a Southern Baptist pastor. I grew up under the teachings of Charles Stanley and Chuck Swindoll and John MacArthur and all those kind of guys and, and everything. And I'm very grateful for my upbringing. Love that the Lord saved me in that and, and everything. But I, when I became a Calvary guy, I said, well, I want to do what Chuck did. So I started teaching through 1 John and uh, verse by verse. And I saw some things in 1 John that did not jive with my preconceived notions, you know things I'd been raised with. And I started to t try and stretch the, well, you know, stretch is not a good word, choke. Well, you choke this Bible into saying what you want it to say, right? And I started tr kind of choking the text to try and make it fit my, my beliefs that I had been raised with. Well, I just chafed under that. I got a little afraid. I don't know. I'm, it feels like I'm, monkeying around with something, I ought to just say it, whatever it says, right? Well, then after I taught First John, I think I taught Romans after that. <laughs> Woo. Romans. You know, that's not a beginner book right there. And when I taught through Romans, I mean, four or five times in the, books of, in the book of Romans, I saw things that, well, for instance, when he talks about Israel as his, um, the, 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 the olive tree, that he broke off. And he says to you Gentiles, the church, he says, you're a grafted in branch and you'd better consider that well because he could snap you off and cast you aside just as easily as he did her. Well, that whole once saved, always saved kind of stuff, see, from my upbringing, started coming into all this. And I all of a sudden started, well, this is not really what it means. This is, it means that, you know, and I started monkeying around with the text to try and make it mean what I had always thought it to mean. And I finally just became exhausted with the process. And I said, Lord, I don't care if it makes me a Baptist, a Calvary guy, and I say that today still. I don't care where that makes me line up. I want to know that I'm just letting it say what it says. See, when I came into Calvary, all the Calvary guys were like, yeah, go ahead, Philip, now you're... Now you're right. But you know, it's a progressive journey, isn't it? I mean, I, I feel like I, I, like I tunneled out of my little Southern Baptist jail cell thinking I was finding freedom in Calvary Chapel, and I tunneled and tunneled and tunneled only to find myself in a bigger jail cell. Yeah. What? I'm still in prison here. So, I, I, you know, freedom was that way, and I went this way, and I, I, it's a bigger prison. You know, I've got you know, people I'm fellowshipping with and all this now. And the reason I say that is to say, here in these verses, we have a warning to anyone that would add to or take away from Revelation specifically. Inaccurate Bible translations add to and take away, do they not? I mean, the reason I teach out of the New King James Version, a lot of Calvary guys use the King James. The reason I don't use the, the uh, um, English Standard 
version, which is that's the academic version today in smart churches, right? Or the New American Standard, that's what I grew up with. Or the NIV. The reason I don't use those translations is because they use the Codex Vaticanus manuscripts and they don't use the Textus Receptus uh, manuscripts. You say, what is the point of that? Well, those, those other translations have 5,000 deletions in the New Testament. I mean, 5,000 words that they have taken away. That's, that's scary stuff. Inaccurate Bible translations can add to or take away. Explaining something away because it doesn't fit my pre-trib view. What? Come on now. That's... See, Calvary chapels, we're pre-trib. Man. We're pre-trib. I hear Calvary guys all the time that insert the rapture into the book of Revelation, and it is not there. I'm not saying that I don't believe in the rapture. I'm saying that I've taught verse by verse, 22 chapters, and I've not seen the word harpezo. I won't even get caught up in that old rapture, Latin, caught up. It's, harpezo is not there. Have you seen it? I haven't. It's not there. doesn't mean I don't believe in it. What, all I mean to say is I'm not trying to be a rebel or anything. I'm just terrified of adding to or taking away from this book. Because I'm not going to have to answer to Chuck Smith one day. I'm going to have to answer to Jesus Christ. And I recognize that, that one day when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord, I'm going to drop to my knees, you're going to drop to your knees, and we're going to see everyone we have loved and respected in the faith on their knees uh, to the left and the right of us. Just people, right? He says, don't add to, don't take away. Don't add to... Don't take away. I'm not trying to be a rebel. I just don't want to add to or take away from His Word. See? Now verse 20, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. And the, 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 the early church would take that last phrase, Even so come Lord Jesus. And they, they made a word, Maranatha, out of that whole sentence. That's the way they greeted one another. They just say, Maranatha. And then the people say, Maranatha, back to you. And it means, even so, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Right, And it's something that started off 2,000 years ago as an expression. I think we need to, to bring it back today. Why? Because in this last chapter of Revelation, not once, but three times, Jesus said, I'm coming, and I'm coming quickly. Did you see that? Look at verse 7. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Verse 12, and behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me. Verse 20, surely, you can count on this as the Greek, I am coming quickly. And that word quickly means without delay. It means suddenly, it means soon, it means shortly. You and I are seeing things happen in the world today that no other generation in the last 2,000 years has seen. We've seen the rebirth of the nation Israel. We've seen a dead religion called Islam. It was wiped out in the 1900s, you know. Rise back up out of the ashes. The Ottoman Empire coming back to life. We see things drawing to, a, if you look at the Middle East, my goodness, the map that we've used that is a picture of the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire, that same piece of real estate is on the news every night. And it's like people just don't even notice it. Guys, we're living so close to the end now. And Jesus says three times. Why three times? Because if you want somebody to hear something, you have to say it three times. I've heard that all my life. Jesus is saying to you and me, I'm coming suddenly. I'm coming quickly. I'm about here. Now, you know, the rapture is not anywhere as I've seen in the book of Revelation, but there is a pre-tribulation rapture allusion in the book of Zephaniah. And I just want to read this verse to you. Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld His justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. 
And Chuck Missler takes that verse to be a pre-tribulation rapture illusion. I read that, and just at a, uh, I mean, just a general understanding of the text, it may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Hidden? Well, kind of like the children of Israel in the land of Goshen. Remember that? In the land of Goshen, all the bad stuff that happened, they were just kind of protected from it and through it. That's, that's a possibility. There's another verse, um, Psalm 27, 5. Psalm 27, 5. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me, and he shall set me high upon a rock. It's just another verse of hope that the Lord gives that whatever you and I have to face, He hides us, He protects us from, from evil. Now, I take comfort in that. I don't know if you do. Well, this book ends with the word grace. And I love that because it's so easy for you and I to, to lose sight of grace. Grace. Amazing grace. And if it's not amazing, it's not grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The end of Revelation. Next Wednesday night, I'm going to teach survey style the whole book in one fell swoop so that you see how the whole thing from the beginning to the end, how it all fits together because sometimes you can miss the forest for the trees, right? So next Wednesday night, I'll give you like a survey uh, we, we will race through Revelation next Wednesday night. And that will get us ready, I think, for whatever the Lord has next. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you are preparing right now a 1,500-mile cubed city made out of gold with transparent streets of gold with 12 floors, each out of different precious stones. These are made with these pearl gates. Lord, you've made all of this for your church, for us to dwell in, to dwell with you in forever. And then we're going to get to drink from this, this flood of supernatural water that flows from the, from the throne itself. And we're going to get to eat fruit off of the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden. Lord, the amazing things that you have for us, we love you. And we look forward to your coming for us, Lord. We pray, Maranatha, even so, come, Lord Jesus. And we pray these things in the all-powerful name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.